for indigenous peoples, the concept of treaty refers to like a broader understanding of relationships and this broader understanding of relationships of like how you work out stuff together um, is something which is, is meant to be flexible, right? And it's meant to be worked out in context and in the day to day. And so a lot of times when indigenous peoples refer to treaty, it's not just a reference to these historic documents, but a reference to a, an idea of how people live well together. Hey folks, what's happening? Welcome to Your Forest. My name is Matthew Kristoff, and on this podcast, we talk about the environment and the science of sustainability. Now, today's episode is actually a rerun, and uh, it's from episode 94 with Matthew Wildcat. Um, as you can see from the title, it's about treaties in Canada. And uh, Matthew is an assistant professor of Native Studies at the University of Alberta, and he kind of specializes in in treaties and explaining treaties and understanding treaties. She's the perfect guy to talk to for this episode. Uh, really, really knows his stuff. And I wanted to re-release this one because I think it is my favorite episode and definitely, I suspect, probably one of the most impactful and important episodes I released. And I, I listen to it probably twice a year, I think, because I just, I want to get that information back in my brain when it kind of slowly seeps out with other stuff getting crammed in there, right? And uh, so I wanted to re-release it to kind of put it back on the radar. And also, Matthew is just such an excellent communicator. He does such an excellent job of communicating the ideas of what a treaty is in Canada, why they were signed, what their intentions were, um, what they're supposed to be, how we should think of them. Um, how they're misunderstood and some of the misconceptions, uh, how they might be the salvation for a, a lot of inequity in Canada and how if we stay true to them, there might be, you know, a lot of awesome things could happen. And uh, he's really a believer that, you know, treaties are a good thing, right? And uh, they just need to be held up to the standards that they're they're intended to. And so with all that, it was an awesome conversation. Like I said, one of my favorites. I won't talk anymore. I'll let you uh, judge for yourself. Sponsors for 2022. Wes Fraser is the number one. Without them, this would not be possible. So thank you, Wes Fraser, for your support. And also, finally, GreenLink Forestry has been with me since the beginning. And without them, this would not be possible. So thank you, GreenLink. And uh, that's it for this one. That's all. Without any further messing around, let's dive into this incredible conversation with Matthew Wildcat all about treaties in Canada. Here we go. I thought a good place to start was uh, we'll be just talking about like how you got into the role that you're in right like so what what made you get into this role like for just first of all just talk about what like what you do yeah and then and what pushed you to go that direction yeah so um i'm an assistant professor of political science and native studies at the university of alberta and you know my specialization is indigenous governance mm -hmm. like broadly conceived uh and you know that involves a whole bunch of things i you know i think part of it is it, it involves like an understanding of our political histories uh you know talking about indigenous uh political thought mm -hmm. and uh and then in particular i'm interested in how uh indigenous peoples govern today and you know, part of that obviously involves our relationship with canadian society right yeah so you know those are kind of the most widely conceived all the things that i'm interested in so uh interestingly enough when i started university i was in i started in engineering okay um which of of course is like you know every uh parent's dream in rural alberta for their kid to go into first year engineering at u of a right There's a lot right. of dropouts right in that first year <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> i know quite a few that's yeah. right one of, yeah. my, one of my buddies he dropped out after a month oh really <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah so <laughs> this is not for me i was like yeah that's yeah. fair it wasn't for me either <laughs> yeah 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 so you know i i was that was my inclination when i was in high school was uh math and sciences um when i went into engineering you know i wasn't um the the school i wasn't you know particularly uh 
motivated or passionate about. But what actually where I switched was I went and worked in um, Syncrude uh, for a summer uh, as a as a summer student. Yeah. And when I was up there, there was this um, you know this moment when I was looking at like all the uh, a map of all the the claims that oil sands companies had on uh, the different areas that they would mine. Uh, and right in the middle of it was uh, Fort Mackay First Nation. And, you know, I, I just thought at that moment, like, you know, this is a, this is a huge project. It's a, you know, it's a huge beast in, in some sort of ways. And I, I think up to that point, I'd always thought, but you know what, there's an opportunity for uh, me as an engineer to make an impact uh, for indigenous peoples. Right. Yeah, totally. And I, and I think in that impact, in that moment, I, I felt very small and I, and I thought, you know what, if, if my main concern is that I want to help indigenous peoples in some sort of way, then I should go do what I want to do. And, right. uh, and I, and then so I switched into native studies that summer. Right. Uh, and, uh, I, I don't think my mom was super pleased about it at oh, really? first. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but then, um, it you doesn't know, seem like there's a future there, right? Like no. there's no direct path to success. <laughs> Absolutely not. Yeah. But you know, you fast forward. Uh, a dozen years from, you know, this is in the, the summer of 2003, you fast forward a dozen years and, uh, all of a sudden, uh, indigenous professors are some of the most, you know, sought out professionals in the country. You, you, you saw the yeah. future coming. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I definitely didn't do it for the job prospects, but it, it certainly helped out. It turned out yeah. uh, pretty good from that standpoint. But, you know, for me, it was always like, I wanted to do something that would help indigenous peoples help, mm -hmm. you know, the community that I'm from, like Urban Skin Cree Nation, which is, you know, one of the four first nations in Musquatchies. And, uh, and, you know, so that was, that was always my inclination. I didn't know how that was going to, you know, when I left engineering, I wasn't sure exactly how that was going to play out. I just knew that I wanted to study something different in school. Yeah. Uh, you and, felt that pull to a different direction. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And, yeah. and, you know, as it, um, you know, I, there's probably a good chance I would have gone into law school, but, um, you know, I went, uh, this, this is a funny story. He's now the Dean of uh, Native Studies at the University of Alberta, Chris Anderson. And, um, I went and played squash with him one day. He was, uh, I was looking for squash partners. Yeah. And so, uh, <laughs> when we were playing squash, he, and you were uh, a student at the time. I was a student at the time. Yeah. yeah. But, you know, he wasn't that much older than me. He's probably, he's probably only like seven or eight years older than me. And so, okay. um, when I, uh, we were playing squash and, uh, and I was telling him about my plans to try to apply for law school. And he said, don't apply for law school. There's already enough, you know, First Nations lawyers. We, we need more, uh, we need more people who are professors. Uh, okay. uh, he said, go, you should go to grad school. And I, yeah. and, uh, you know, I was impressionable at the time. And so I, I did that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 for sure. Yeah. Uh -huh. That's awesome. So, uh, like your, your upbringing too, like, right. You say you grew up in Moscow cheese and like, so what was that? What was that like for you? And how, what did that, like looking back yeah, backwards, how do you think that shaped um, your focus, like your pro professional focus today? Yeah. You know, so for me, um, I think growing up on reserve was uh, super valuable because you just, you pick up so much information, but also you live in a context that is like, you know, constantly politicized, I would say in totally. a way. So it's, people are always talking about politics. Um, and often it, for, for me, my family was often talking about the, the politics of the reserve. Like, and in particular, how do you, you know, oh. how do you improve, how do you improve the nation? Like, how do you improve how urban skin Cree nation is, is run? And, how do you say that? Uh, urban skin. Urban skin. Cree nation. That's yeah. The, that's the nation you're from. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And so, you know, for, for me, that was, those conversations were just like, you know, ever present, yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. ubiquitous, right? And so, oh, okay. um, so not so much like, I mean, I'm sure you guys talked about provincial and federal politics as well, but there's a lot of local politics. About, there's a lot yeah. of local politics. And obviously when you talk about First Nations politics, your relationship with Canadian society is ever present, right? So, yeah. you know, one of the, and this is, this is, uh, funnily enough, something Chris Anderson says, when you're, uh, indigenous, um, you have no choice but to be well versed in what Canadian society is and how it impacts you. But when you live, when you're non indigenous, you can often ignore indigenous peoples. You don't have to have a, a good sense of who they are, right. what your relationship with them is. Um, you know, obviously we come into conflict like indigenous people and non indigenous people. Perfect example right, right now is the, uh, is the, uh, um, oh God, I forget their name now. 
the Mi'kmaq the out Mi- in the Mi'kmaq in, yeah, yeah, in, in Nova, Nova Scotia Nova in the Scotia fishery. Right yeah, no, it's Crazy, you know, yeah. but that's a long standing, like, you know, that it seems, um, spectacular in some ways, like, you know, having this, uh, Mi'kmaq, um, is that how you said it? I thought it was Mi'kmaq, but okay. Mi'kmaq, yeah, I okay. think it's, uh, Mi'kmaq is, is, um, correct. I'm pretty sure. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'll believe you on that one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Every you other know, source that I've read has been definitely from a white context. So. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so it seems spectacular, right? Yep. Seeing the, this like, uh, Mi'kmaq lobster warehouse lit on fire. Yeah. Um, the spike strips. I saw it, there was a bunch of fishermen putting spike strips down. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, and, and, yeah. and so, but you know, these things like, I think are always kind of bubbling under the surface, yeah. but then sometimes they erupt. Right. And yeah. I, and I think that's, we can probably actually characterize a lot of, uh, relationships with, between indigenous and non-indigenous peoples in this country as, um, you know, there, there's always these kind of like tensions totally. that exist. And then sometimes they erupt into these spectacular events. And then when the spectacular events happen, you know, we want to think like, you know, this seems ridiculous. Like, where did this all come from? But it's, it's really, it's just like sometimes it boils over, right? Yeah. And and these are tensions that happened from like since they've been rising since colonization, really, since, since these two societies have like come together, right? That's like, right. Yeah. So this is going on for hundreds of years that we've been, and like, yeah, it's a, it's, 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 it's weird to even like, I find it strange to even have to talk about it sometimes because it's so mm-hmm. uncomfortable, mm-hmm. right? Everyone, we want to imagine that like, no, no, like this is Western society. Like we, everyone prospers. We're doing really well. Uh-huh. Like, you know, we have democracy. We have free markets. We have this. We have that. And it just yeah. seems like, oh, we're doing pretty good. Like we should be happy. And it's like, well, the truth is some people aren't. And, yeah. And, and, and disproportionately so indigenous folks in Canada really are not, right? Yeah. Like it's, it's a hard go. And like you said, we, we've been – like, like I, I'm a perfect example. I've been fortunate enough to be able to – I could go through my entire life and never know anything about Indigenous folks and, I, and it probably wouldn't really affect me. Mm-hmm. But like but like you said, like Indigenous folks need to understand all of that just to be able to operate at all because there's different rules. There's different – like there's different restrictions, different – and there's and there's the whole, you know, the shame of that's been created around that – you know what I mean? Around that culture as yeah. well. So it's just the whole, it's just, it's, it's weird to have to even talk about it. Right. Cause you don't want to admit that it, that it exists. Yeah. Right. Well, you know, and part of the, you know, the power balance, um, between indigenous and non-indigenous people's country is that, you know, for indigenous peoples, when we have to, um, negotiate and talk through issues of conflict and, you know, these we're often forced to do so on uh, the terms set out by non-Indigenous people, right? And yeah. you know what I mean by that is, you know, we have to do it on the basis of Canadian law. Um, we have to do it on the basis of, you know, kind of like very entrenched. And um, I, these ideas are typically so entrenched that they're taken for granted, right? Yeah. But ideas of like, you know, what is the individual and like individual mm. rights, yeah. uh, equality before the law, Rule of law, you know, these are all terms that we hear getting tossed around when people, yeah. when we try to work through these difficult concepts, right? Mm-hmm. Or that, you know, these difficult conflicts that, that people have. Yeah. Um, uh, but what people don't understand is when we are forced to use those terms, we're using terms that have already, are already kind of like, uh, tilted towards non indigenous, tilted in favor of non indigenous peoples in, in terms of, um, you know, how we, how we figure this stuff out. Yeah. And so, um, you know, a concept like treaty, I think is, is probably one of our most important, um, is, is probably really something that is, should be a touchstone for more people in Canadian society. Cause at least at a, at a some respects, what it does is it, um, tilts our understandings back in uh, towards, uh, indigenous people's own understandings of, uh, concepts like justice, yeah. law, uh, fairness. Yeah. Uh, and so that's why I think it's such a, an, an interesting concept, actually. Totally. Well, mm-hmm. that, that's, and, and yeah, that's why we're all here today, right? Like the, the, the whole concept of treaties and w- like, what the hell is a treaty really? Like, I, like I'm sure you have a very good understanding <laughs> yeah. of it, right? <laughs> yeah. But I think, and I, I imagine most indigenous folks understand the full history of, 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 you know, the context and the treaties and all that. But like, I can honestly say that I, I mean, I grew up in Northern Alberta, right? Amongst, mm-hmm. like, lots of lots of indigenous folks and i was able to 
come through that without really knowing anything about treaties, mm-hmm. right? Besides like the, the stuff, oh, they're exempt from taxes and they and they get all kinds of money from the government and this this kind of stuff, right? And you're like, mm-hmm. I don't even know if any of that's true, right? Yeah. At the time, it's just it's just the it's just the stereotypes you hear being in, in a northern town, right? And so it's. I want to start by talking about exactly like, yeah, let's talk about like what a treaty is and try to provide some real factual context for what that is going into this. And then like, so we can try to dissuade some of these stereotypes and some of this misunderstanding. Cause like Mm -hmm. that's all of this, all of this combativeness is it's all comes from misunderstanding, right? Like different, Mm -hmm. just different perspectives because of, I would say mostly ignorance on on the part of, 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 you know, white folks and stuff like that, right? Like settler folks, like we're, we're just, we don't know. So we need to know in order to have like an actual conversation that's functional. Yeah. You know, when you're talking, it actually reminds me of uh, an interview I did with Roger Epp last year for one of my classes. Uh, And when he talks about treaty, one of the things he says is a lot of times non-Indigenous people think treaty is just like benefits that yeah. Indigenous people get, yes, right? that's right. Uh, and it's not an understanding of treaty as a two-way relationship because, no. you know, the the huge part of treaty is that uh, non-Indigenous people get to live here in Canada, right? Like, yeah. and, like that's what treaties allow for is they allow for um, the creation of Canada, right? And so – and you know, this is, it's more pertinent to um, what people often call the number treaty. So this is treaties uh, one through 12. And so for instance, where you grew up in treaty eight uh, in in Slave Lake, this is part of the the numbered uh, treaty area, right? And Mm -hmm. so is almost uh, the entirety of the Prairie provinces are covered by the numbered uh, treaties. Uh, And then, you know, parts of BC and Northern Canada and Ontario are also covered by the number treaties. Right. Um, But you know, there's a very specific understanding of treaties for amongst Indigenous people who signed uh, the number treaties. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, it's <laughs> these benefits um, are, you know, are, are seen, I think from Indigenous peoples, a lot, of, a lot of times these benefits are seen as these should be small prices to pay for the ability to like live in Canada to benefit from all of the resources. Uh, and for, you know, and, and this was, this is the terms of a, a two-way agreement right or a two-way relationship so you know i think though it's it's also a difficult concept to understand sometimes because treaties refer to actual historic agreements yeah but for indigenous peoples the concept of treaty refers to like a broader understanding of relationships and this broader understanding of relationships of like how you work out stuff together um is something which is it's meant to be flexible right and it's meant to be worked out in context and in the day-to-day right and so a lot of times when indigenous peoples refer to treaty it's not just a reference to these historic documents but a reference to a- an idea of how people live well together yeah right, right and right. and so that that living well together is the is what i tend to think about when i think about treaty right um because that's what we have to figure out today um but they also refer to historic documents so you know um you know so historically um Treaty 8 um, through 12 were signed a little bit later on. They were signed from 1899, uh, and I believe Treaty 12 was signed in 1923. Okay. Um, And those uh, treaties are signed in more, you know, remote areas of Canada, uh, were often opened up for the purposes of uh, mining. uh, And um, whereas treaties... Um, one through seven were primarily signed for the purposes of opening up uh, uh, agriculture, agricultural settlement oh, okay. on behalf of non-Indigenous peoples, right? Okay. And in particular, um, the ability to build a railroad um, because of non-agricultural settlement. So, okay. So, the, so, so uh, let's back up just a little bit. So, the idea of, of treaties, like from the understanding of Indigenous folks, was from this idea of like we are two nations, like two sovereign nations that are coming together to agreements so we can live like learn to work and live together yeah. on this place that we call Canada now, yeah. right? Um and so going into the signing of those treaties, can we like let's let's I would like to paint a picture yeah. of like the two different groups going into these treaties, the two different perceived intentions, or maybe you have like factual um like 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 proof of the intentions going in and, and, the, yeah. and the ideas that you can discuss and kind of what 
they came out with the, what was the understanding they came out of that area with like with that signing of the of the treaty with absolutely yeah, yeah. so you know i think you know when when i talk about like treaties are what like gave birth to canada yeah. um you know i think one of the the ways in which th- that why that should be important to everyone is because if that's not the story uh that lies at the the root of canada as a legitimate country um then the other story that we have to tell is one of conquest right. but really there wasn't really a lot of conquest in canada like yes there was the real rebellion but that happened after treaties were signed actually and it, it's not really there wasn't a you know kind of a formal um there was never any ever a formal effort on the part of canada to like achieve its sovereignty through conquest no like the states where it was like let's yeah yeah but even in the situation. states typically um they're what are often referred to as the indian wars uh, down there um which you know antiquated term but um we got it still too yeah, yeah. <laughs> even those typically occur after um treaties so e- right e- even yeah, in the yeah. states there was so in the states there's like over 600 treaties between uh the united states and indigenous nations um and usually conflict happens after the treaties they uh, uh, often tr- the conflict happens because the treaties aren't being fulfilled uh, even yes. in, right and so okay. even in the states um there's little ability to tell a story which is based purely on conquest either although they did uh fight militarily a lot more than <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah there was a bit of that going yeah. on yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah a good amount of it yeah. yeah but you know so the the tricky part is that if if it's not based on treaties it's not based on conquest um then the story canada has to tell is is this story uh based on the doctrine of discovery which is that um canada exists because when europeans showed up they automatically gained title to land because hey, this is ours they were, <laughs> yes exactly right and you know this is where it's and we actually have lots of symbols which you know show that you know europeans showing up and planting a flag right yeah. and and so and that is just like you know, it's not even trying to hide its racism. It's just explicitly racist. We get this land because we're European, we're white, and we got it. It's we're ours. we're superior. We're better than other people, right? Like yeah. this is like the definition of racism, right? right? Sure, so, yeah. yeah, for and sure. So, so you know, this is not the story that I think Canada wants to tell about its foundations or origins, right? Either, but unfortunately, without treaties, that's the story Canada has to tell, right? right. And, and in fact, in some parts of the country, that's the only story Canada can tell right now. We're actually lucky enough in a place like Alberta to be able to say, you know, we can actually talk about treaties as the foundation of, of a legitimate society, right? And most people don't, like I say most people, most, most uh, you know, non-Indigenous folks don't see treaties as the foundation or a foundation of Canada, right? Mm-hmm. They see it as this like this thing off to the side that like just don't think about it, don't worry about it. Yeah. So it's like, and I don't mean that as like being offensive to non-indigenous folks. I just mean like it's not on our radar for the most part, right? Yeah. So it's like that right there is even just like a huge discrepancy in how we view this, right? So yes. I want I want to talk about all of this misconception and all this. So so yeah, keep going about yeah. treaties and how that's the foundation of what you know, we got going on. So it's so it's interesting. A, a recent um, this is a legal political history by uh, a s- scholar named Peter Russell. He says Canada is a, a country of incomplete conquests. Uh, <laughs> you know, and it was you know it, it, like it, it, that's you know yeah. it, again like it's literally can, this, that's not the story Canada can tell. Is right. you know it's like. There was British people never were able to like fully achieve a conquest over other, you know, not only indigenous, but uh, people in Quebec as well. Right. And so, um, but I think what he says is, you know what, it's not the worst thing because what it allows us or what it should give us is the foundation to try to work out um, relationships in the present in the day to day. Right. You know, all this being said though, there are, there is like a historical background of treaties. And so, you know, out here in the Prairie Provinces, um, this was at one point called Rupert's Land. Yep. And the reason it was called Ru- uh, Rupert's Land was it was all the territory draining into the Hudson's Bay. And it was Rupert's Land because it was claimed by Prince Rupert right. uh, through a, a discovery claim, right? So right. this is like the doctrine of discovery was an actual um, law between nations in Europe of how they would recognize each other's claims to non-European lands, right? And so... Um, Isn't this- it amazing that you could just imagine that like 
Canada right now. We were just like sailing off into whatever, into some ocean. We're like, we find this massive land. We're like, hey guys, this is ours. We got yes, it. Like, that's right. this belongs to us now. And you're like, wait, 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 hold on one second here. Like, yeah, like it's, it's amazing that, that like the disconnect there, right? But anyways, uh-huh. continuing. Uh-huh. <laughs> and I think, you know, I, I would have to go look it up, but I'm quite certain, uh, in this instance, it didn't even involve setting foot on land. It was a voyage by Henry Hudson, and I think it was uh, 1611 or so, where he just sailed through Hudson's Bay, and then he said, all the lands draining into this bay, I claim on behalf of uh, Britain. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, Let it, me just claim a third of yes, North America. It's yeah. ours, yeah. You know, of course, it took um, almost like 250 years for Britain to have effective control in the lands draining into Hudson's Bay, because, you know, really Canada didn't gain effective control uh, in the Prairie Provinces until... Um, the late 1800s at the very minimum. Sure. Uh, and, and in parts of Northern Canada, it was actually not well into the 1900s where yeah. Canada was able to gain effective control over territory. Um, but in, so, um, in 1869, uh, as, you know, two years after Canada becomes a nation, um, one of the things that happens is it, you know, um, it looks to expand. And so, uh, what it does is it, um, makes an agreement with the Hudson's Bay Company, which owns the original charter on uh, issued by the King of England. That's another bananas thing. To, the fact that yeah. like literally two thirds of Canada was owned by a company. You're like, yes. well, what? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Up until 135 years ago. Uh-huh. Yeah. And you know, so that uh, charter granted to the Hudson's Bay Company, um, they held uh, title based on a you know a claim of discovery, right? Mm. And so Canada went and bought that claim of discovery off of the Hudson's Bay mm-hmm. in 1869. Yeah. And so um, indigenous peoples hear of this transaction and say, hold on a second. Yeah. <laughs> you know, what's, what's going on here? Like yeah. this is this Hudson's Bay company. This was not yours to sell. In, yeah. in fact, as far as we know, um, you know, you're just, a, you know, a couple thousand uh, people at most at any given time. Um, mostly congregated around a few forts, yeah. um, within our territory. Like this is, you don't, we're still the rulers of this, you know, yeah, this yeah, land. Yeah. Like, um, and you know, while the, the history of the fur trade, you know, obviously involves all sorts of, um, you know, people might say, uh, deceit or that, you know, there might have been, um, Sometimes indigenous peoples may have been taken advantage of in the fur trade. There's also still benefits that indigenous peoples get from the fur trade. But more particularly, the Hudson's Bay Company also relies on indigenous peoples as well yeah. in this uh, relationship. There's totally. There has to be a partnership. For a long time. Some, yeah. yeah. And in particular to, to eat. Like there's the, the only way that people at the forts are eating often is that indigenous peoples are – um, selling them food that, yeah. you know they've harvested themselves right? oh yeah completely dependent on them yeah. to a lot of the parts yeah. yeah but of course with canada this relationship starts to change right because rather than uh, a partnership which is really in many ways b- built on indigenous economies uh indigenous you know transport systems mm-hmm. um canada with settlement comes to um impose its own you know systems of transportation mm-hmm communication, supply chains, all of those over indigenous territories, right? And it, yeah. it dramatically alters the relationship of, of power. Totally. And so, you know, it's, that was a bit of an aside, but, um, That's okay. <laughs> uh, you know, but just to distinguish what's different between the Hudson's Bay company and Canada. Right. Yep, and sure. And so with, um, you know, Hudson's Bay company sells its, you know, claim its discovery claim to Canada in 1869 Indigenous peoples hear about it and say, if you're going to come into this territory, you have to deal with us. Like, you can't just deal with the Hudson's Bay. And so treaties, the number treaties start getting signed only two years later in 1871. That's the first, that's treaty number one. Mm -hmm. And then Canada signs one every year for the next seven years until uh, 1877 when it signs treaty seven and then has a small break okay. Um, after that. But this is dealing primarily with what they would call like the fertile, like agricultural belt. Right. Where uh, agriculture um, would be taking place. And that that's where, if you go look at a map of treaties one through seven, you'll say, mm-hmm. okay, that's, you know, this Prime is, settler territory. Yes, yeah, this yeah, is yeah. clearly yeah. where all yeah. the farming's taking place, yeah. right? Um, and so when Canada comes to deal with indigenous peoples over these treaties, it's, there is an agreement that 
they're dealing about land, but their each side's understanding of it looks very different. And right. so um for indigenous peoples, there's an understanding that you know there is there is notions of property and ownership, but not in the not as sedimented as we you would find in a British tradition at that time. Okay. Right. And so um there's an idea that we'll share land. So reserves are what we have left over, but also we retain rights to hunting uh, and to mo- movement over the rest of our territories. And also, um, you know, most people's in- understanding of the treaties is we'll retain mineral rights as well under the land because uh, this deal is just about agriculture. At that point, so yeah. at that point, they were even like thinking about mineral rights and that kind of stuff and like below the ground That's right. yeah. resources. Yeah. So what were, I, I suppose, hey, they would have mines and they would have, you know, for whatever. Yeah, I guess. Okay. Like, I think by that point, people, there's an understanding of coal at some right. extent as well. Right. Yeah. Right, right. Of its. Indigenous folks would have too. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And yeah. so, um, w- but also it's an understanding that, you know, this is territory that we'll share together sure right? and we'll have to work out what that sharing looks like okay over time uh and as part of this sharing um there's certain benefits that we accrue right from this so these are what people would call treaty rates so today um just before we continue on um so going into this this wasn't like uh this wasn't like a canada going to indigenous folks being like hey sign this thing or else it was it was more like like two nations coming together being like hey we're all we're gonna be here let's learn to live together and yeah. come to some kind of agreement where we can compromise and, and work something out yeah right so by this point you know um indigenous peoples would be well aware that european expansion was taking place sure. in I, I think in lots of parts of the world but in you know um in particular in in the states right mm-hmm. like indigenous peoples and what become the canadian prairies mm-hmm are well aware that, um, you know, that there is, is an expansion. There's a potential for conflict. If yeah. You, yeah. Okay. And then there's also a growing awareness of this kind of um, what by that point is a very clear, like ecological disaster of like bison herds collapsing. Right. right? And so, yep. and so this is also being the primary economy like the the pillar of like indigenous economies oh right because yeah they were the, everything their whole fur trade everything was based off of the bison all that kind of stuff and if they're they're down to a thousand by the end of what is the end of the 1880s there's only like a thousand left in all of yeah. North america really uh-huh. so it's like that's a versus whatever it was like 30 million or something at one point so yeah it's, yeah like a bison was um was a huge part of the fur trade but primarily for food actually and, yeah right uh, yeah, of the, course the furs themselves were became very important um to industrial development prior to the invention of rubber right uh because bison um uh hides were much stronger like bison leather was super strong and was yeah. required for uh drive belts actually in oh. a lot of in a lot of uh yeah. industrial expansion mm-hmm. uh in particular in the eastern united states and so that was actually a, one of the causes right of this right. this overhunting but then also you know, many people say that there was a an explicit attempt on the part of the American government to exterminate bison herds um, mm-hmm. once once there was like kind of a, you know an, an alternate. Yeah, and there's uh, evidence of that too. There's letters that go mm-hmm. back and forth between governing bodies and stuff, and yeah, yeah, all kinds of yeah, get rid of the Indian problem thing. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. so. Um, so I, I guess, I guess actually just for context for people. So uh, let me get this straight. So we're kind of talking about like indigenous people have been living on this land for thousands of years, kind of living with it, uh, whatever. And then, um, settlers come in, the landscape starts to change. And so their ability to live off the landscape and just, and you know what I mean? Is, is, is starting to be diminished through lots of things. But one of the main things is the loss of, of bison herds. Right. Mm-hmm. So then they have to start to seek new ways of, of living, I guess. Of, yeah. Right. So then, then they start to become part of part of the economy because this kind of have no choice at this point to start uh-huh. to so follow into the Western way of doing things. Yeah. Right. Okay. So okay. treaties were meant to allow for a transition to agriculture on behalf of indigenous peoples. And if you go read the actual yeah. text of the treaties, a lot of it has to do with the agricultural implements that you would get. Ah. Uh, in fact, yeah. And right. so this was, you know, so for indigenous peoples, there's obviously their um. Indigenous peoples are signing treaties under duress in a lot of ways. And, you know, 
we often say that you know the validity of contracts is questionable if they're signed under duress right yeah no kidding but also it's people being strategic and trying to look to the future as well right and mm-hmm. so i don't i don't think that entirely disqualifies the validity of of treaties and also you know indigenous peoples continue to point to treaties as something which is we should uphold <laughs> yeah they, yeah they like the idea of the treaties as it was like yeah. as they were as it was understood at the time right yeah. like yeah but that's it's, right. it's the interpretation has been altered so that's right so so going into signing these treaties let's say like treaty number one or whatever yeah. any treaty pick whatever one you want um going into signing these treaties the concept of signing something or or the the concept of 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 legality or the concept of like even like 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 I said before we started reading like even being able to speak or read english like are these concepts that are that are understood or is this just like like what what is the indigenous mindset going into these conversations uh-huh. so there were there wouldn't have been too many uh indigenous peoples who would have spoke english at the time very few in fact there was uh, far far more white people who spoke cree than there was uh cree people who spoke english okay uh, at that time and actually um you know i i've heard stories of the shopkeepers in muskuchis um like the non native shopkeepers they spoke Cree up until the 1950s. Oh. In fact, it was just, you know, that was the lingua franca of the, of the area, right? Yeah. And so, um, so there was a lack of understanding of that part, but also indigenous peoples brought interpreters. Uh, and there's kind of varying degrees of interpretation of how well the interpreters work. So in Treaty 6, for instance, uh, the interpreter was a guy by the name of Peter Erasmus, um, who he has a, there's a fascinating, uh, book about him that he, it's like an as told to book. So he explained this book to an author and then the author transcribed it and wrote it down. It's called Buffalo Days and Nights. Uh, okay. and it's a really cool book because it, it gives a real sense of what life was like back then, at least for this, you know, for Peter Erasmus. Yep. And, uh, many people today consider himself Metis, but interestingly enough in the book, he doesn't consider – he never identifies as anything, really. He's just like a guy living on the prairies. Oh, okay. Uh, and so he, okay. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, yeah. he has indigenous ancestry, but mm-hmm. he, you know, he uh, lives with multiple groups of people, right? right? And so sometimes he lives in – He's not culturally explicit with anybody. No, right? he yeah. lives in Métis uh, communities at the time. Mm-hmm. Um, he uh, also lives in uh, First Nations community, like Cree communities. And, you know, sometimes he um, – uh, you know, has relationships primarily with white people as well. And so sure, it's actually sure. interesting when I read the book because yeah. I was like, what, what is this guy even? And so it's like, <laughs> <laughs> Whose side are you <laughs> on? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, but, but he could speak Cree and English fluently. Okay. Uh, and so there's good reason to believe that there was some level of understanding, but of course at, at a certain level, there's just difference in, not only just worldviews, but like your understanding of what certain political concepts mean, right? Because, you know, as humans, so much of what we understand is it's kind of like below the surface, right? It's like implicit. It's just kind of there. Sure. And we don't necessarily uh, articulate it or, or like make explicit every single thing we mean. But, you know, when you when you share a language with somebody, mm-hmm. um, you develop all those common understandings, right, yeah. over over time. And so... You know, one of the stories, this is a professor at U of A, James Dempsey. Um, he, he uses to illustrate this divide is, um, so after the real uh, resistance in 1885, um, one of the things that happens is a Cree chief, Big Bear, is charged with treason. And um, when he's charged with treason, the interpreter is uh, telling him in Cree, um, you've been charged with stealing the queen's hat. Uh, and big bear is incredulous and he says why would i possibly try to steal the queen's hat i did not even know that she had a hat right but it's like you know it's what's being interpreted to him is like this is a a crime against the crown right right Uh, like the you know the queen of england right yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. and so you know and so you know these there there was an ability to communicate uh somewhat but but also there would have been difficulties as well. And so you can see why something like this disagreement, you know, on, on the part of the crown treaties are meant to purchase land to, you know, yeah. they have terms like seed release and surrender. 
um forever and, yeah, yeah and so they're yeah. supposed to, you know they're thought of as being land sales and you can see how indigenous peoples um there's you know okay wait like we're gonna share the land right you know because you're just coming at it from like two different from traditions that that just have kind of like different implicit understandings. I'll say, of, do they do, do indigenous folks at this time really like? I'm sure they understand the concept of property, but like, is that is that concept of property? Is it as like ingrained in their society as like as like European culture, right? Like, this is mine; it belongs to me. Like, you know, kind of thing, or is it like I, I feel like I feel like indigenous culture was more like communal and like we're like you know what I mean? Yeah, is that true? Or? Like, there people would have absolutely had some understanding of like um you know this is land that i use right um and it's not that i th- i'm the only person who can use this land but if you're going to use it you should you should come talk to me sure 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 like hey we yeah. should we should work out something so we're yeah. not stepping on each other's toes that's right yeah but it wasn't mm-hmm. you know there was the idea of like drawing uh boundaries or like land surveys all you those... stay off my land you yeah i'll stay off. yeah like that not none, none of that stuff but actually going back just a second thinking about like legal documents like i've yeah. I, like i remember reading through and like listening to interpretations of the of how the treaty of the treaties themselves how they're written i think i listened to a documentary and they were reading out treaty nine wordage right mm-hmm. and it was like even for me today, it's difficult for me to understand what exactly the hell are like, – like there's a reason we have lawyers, right? <laughs> yeah. Because like you can't read a legal document and be like, oh, I understand this completely because most of the words is like uh, hither now and for unto then yeah. and uh, shit like that. And you're like even a person who speaks perfectly good English doesn't know what the hell they're talking about. Uh-huh. So how is someone who speaks Cree and is being – having that being interpreted – to them like how are they supposed to understand that concept so just you know what i mean the lost by interpretation kind of thing right like yeah it's not like just because those words have been translated doesn't mean like i'm sure cree doesn't have a word for most of the stuff like you said the crown like they probably don't yeah. have a word for crown yeah so he said hat and yeah. it's like how the hell is he supposed to know what that means there's no context there right <laughs> yeah. so it's like it's almost like to me it almost seems like there was there was no real chance or opportunity for indigenous folks to really understand what they were signing, what they were doing. Is that yeah. fair to say or is that – or am I being over- – You know, it, it's it's tough to say because, you know, the the, his, the histories on all this are um, – He said, it's she still, said. It's a, yeah. still an open question a little sure. bit, right? Okay. And to what extent people would have had um, understanding. So, you know, there's – there's lots of good history textbooks and I you know, I, I think the the biggest thing is that there probably was a an opportunity for understanding, but an opportunity for understanding has to be made between two parties who are, you know, really truly trying to make an agreement with each other, right? And yeah. so while, you know, there was clearly you know, a high a high interest on the part of indigenous peoples to make an agreement which would allow for you know new life right that transition to farming because they were they were like there was some struggle at that time they couldn't yeah. follow their normal so there was some desire to like hey we would like to prosper again and this will be good for us this will help our communities help our yeah. culture that's yeah. right okay. so um you know there was much less incentive and motivation on the part of the canadian government to make an agreement which would allow for two people to live together sure. right and so for instance um you know the starkest example of this is probably in treaty 6 um where we are today is you know signed in 1876 mm-hmm. that's the same year that the indian act is created as well right. what is the purpose of the indian act um it's to enfranchise uh native people so that um slowly over time uh, all native people will become you know "Quote unquote, like full Canadian citizens will no longer no yeah. longer have the rights of uh, Indian status, and uh, and then the you know the what people would have called it the so called Indian problem like would dis- gradually disappear as Indigenous people became assimilated into Canadian society, right? Yeah. So we now know that this is was a complete failure of a policy, and that, like very few people ever enfranchised. Um, but you can see that you know there. Were, you know, on the part of the government of Canada signing this uh, document over, um, uh, you know, over land at that time, there wasn't really uh, an anticipation that what it was going to lead to was a, a long-term relationship between Indigenous peoples in right. Canada. With respect, we'll sign this thing, they'll become us, and we'll continue to do what we yep. want to do. And so just a complete, like, complete misunderstanding by both parts of what this 
what this agreement means really like yeah yeah, yeah absolutely and you know and so you know and but but also you know one of the things that would inhibit coming to an agreement is that there can there's a, a common vision of what the agreement is supposed to ensure moving into the future right yeah. and on the part of canada there was no motivation or uh no thought that this agreement would create a, a relationship that uh, is to last sure okay right and so I, to me that's probably the bigger piece rather than um an inability for the two groups to understand each other okay yeah okay so treaties weren't supposed to be something we're talking about today. They're, no, yeah, absolutely not. Government, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I, I think that's probably also too why the Canadian government um, was, you know, willing to kind of like have language like, you know, as long as like the sun shines and the rivers flow and, you know, right. the, all the, you know, or I don't think that language is often included in the treaties, but those are things that are like the historical record very clearly shows um treaty negotiators on behalf of the government of Canada use language like that. Uh, absolutely. Like that is like um, fairly uncontroversial. Right. Uh, but, you know, for them, they're like, you know, they're like saying stuff like that. But then in the back of their mind, they're thinking that that's, well, these treaties won't last forever because Indigenous peoples aren't, aren't going to last forever. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. So now that we've kind of painted that picture, so what, so what happens after the signing of the treaties? Like how does that change uh, the way indigenous people can live, like obviously with the treaties came the, the formulation of reserves and stuff too, right? That was mm -hmm. around this, that was, that was part of the treaty or was that a separate thing? F reserves are part of treaties. Yeah. They're part but, of treaties. Okay. Yeah. So when, so after the signing happens and they, you know, both groups kind of go their separate ways and go about their lives. However, um, how long is it until indigenous folks realize that like, oh shit, this isn't what we thought it was. It probably very soon after. Yeah. yeah like okay. I, almost immediately I would. Okay. I would suggest. Yeah. And, you know, you know, so again, um, on like in Treaty 6, you have the, you know, the real resistance in 1885. This is only, um, nine years after the signing of, of Treaty 6. And of course, the real resistance in many ways and was revolved around Métis struggles. Mm -hmm. Um, but not entirely. It was a, a general discontent. And, and so, you know, one of the ways in which you can think about that is you have this like old order, this indigenous order where there's kind of like multiple indigenous actors involved. So like you have Métis people, Cree, yeah. Assiniboine, and Soto. Um, and then, you know, like Blackfoot and, southern alberta obviously and and you know so this old order is coming into confrontation with this new order the canadian order that's trying to um get set up and so even though it is a um you know real was metis and it was led by metis people it it also is indicative of a larger uh discontent that had happened at that time because yeah. by that point um, people already feel that treaties aren't being lived up to, and and right. if actually if you look at the the terms of the agreement, they're they're absolutely not being lived up to. So, okay. um, let's the, describe it. Let's talk about exactly like what what wasn't lived up to, like legally speaking, even like from the Canadians' yeah. perspective, what did they not do that they were supposed to do, even mm -hmm. from their perspective? And then uh, I'd like to talk about how uh, I'm assuming that the indigenous condition kind of declined post treaties, like things started getting really bad after that, right? Yeah. When they were supposed to get better. They were supposed to prosper. And so let's describe how that created that situation, like up and up until today, even right. Like why, yeah. why the situation that we're in now where we're, we're you know, reserves are largely failing their people and like there's there's just a lot of conflict. There's a lot of uh cultural shame, you know what I mean, around around being indigenous for a lot of people and that mm -hmm. kind of stuff. So let's like I just want to talk about how kind of like how we got to where we are today, right? Like this yeah. is what this is all about. How do we get to here? So after the treaties, what's kind of the step by step process towards like getting to where we are now? Yeah. So I think to everyone's surprise, um Buffalo herds um, went down way faster than everyone thought they were going to. Yeah. And and I think most people thought that... You said Treaty 1 was signed when? 69? 1871. Or sorry. Yeah. 1871. Mm -hmm. So yeah, because I think the, the, the huge... I think the big push of the, of the bison fur trade mm 
was just starting just a couple years before that. I think it kind of, there was like a 12 year period where they killed like, I can't remember. It was like a couple, like 10 million bison yes. died in like 12 years in the yeah. plains. Yeah. And it ended around 1880 something or other. So yeah. it was right at the beginning of this massive exodus. That's of bison. right. Yeah. yeah. And so it, it happened way quicker than everyone thought it was going to. And you know, what it did is it created a, a economic hardship that was, you know, unparalleled, I guess, right? Yeah, yeah. And so, you know, so one of the big stipulations of the treaties that, uh, and when Canadian negotiators came, they had a template, but they were altered. Um, the terms of the treaties were altered through the course of negotiations. Okay. And so one of the big things that indig Indigenous negotiators insisted on was a famine and pestilence clause. And that's, you know, in times of famine, um, that the Canadian government would be uh, able and willing to provide um, food so people didn't starve, mm -hmm. right? And yep. so, and this is, you know, of course, the um, treaty negotiators talk about, you know, the queen is um, rich enough that she will be able to take care of, you know, all of her children in sure. any parts of the world, right? Right. Kind of using language like that. Okay. Uh, and so, you know the the big one right after the treaties are signed is that there actually is famines that that arise right um but that um the Canadian government doesn't um provide foodstuffs even though it often has the ability to sure. and even sometimes in in some cases you have instances where you have food in storehouses uh and it's going rotten uh and no one is eating it because of really often it's because of the stubbornness of different uh, Indian agents on the prairies yeah. who are refusing to provide food. It still comes to down people. to people in the end. Yeah. 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 And yeah. so, and you know, this was done for all sorts of reasons, but you know, often it was just like cruelty. And then, uh, and, and then sometimes I think there was racism involved as well um, with these decisions not to live up to that treaty negotiation or like that treaty obligation. Yeah. Right? And, this is, and this is stuff that's been proven, right? Like this yeah. is like, this is not just like hearsay. It's not just your opinion. This is yeah. stuff that's like, no, we have this document. So the, the, it has been, was documented in an amazing way by an author named James Dashtuck, um, who I, I think was at the university of, um, Saskatchewan and, uh, his book is called clearing the plains. And this was actually a, a national bestseller. Um, uh, and he really like, <laughs> Um, you know, it was, it was kind of well known about that there was this kind of, you know, awful period on the prairies where people were starving, but he really went and did the archival work to really just like map it out, um, what took place during those years. Okay. Yeah. Found so, yeah. and then of course it's, you know, it's not only, um, starvation, but of, of course, um, there's all sorts of other, uh, diseases that when people are malnourished that arise as well. Right. Sure. And so there, you know, these are very, very difficult times. I was uh, I, I, I was reading something that was saying that the the regulations around farming and agriculture for settlers and indigenous folks were different and that there was higher there were stricter regulations on indigenous people than there was on settlers so like even so if there was a famine indigenous people would be the last ones able to like do something about it kind of thing. Is, mm -hmm. is that true or is that unfair to say? You know, I, you might be referring to a little bit later down okay. the history. So, you know, obviously indigenous peoples rebound uh, eventually and and often and many times actually get um, uh, farming up and running and, and are quite successful at yeah, it. Yeah. And so there's a couple different, um, but there's a couple different policies implemented by uh, the Department of Indian Affairs, which really undercut indigenous people so one um is indigenous peoples aren't able to un to sell their um goods on the market um oh. like everyone else but have to receive permission from indian agents and of course you have uh white farmers in the area who are um lobbying the government of canada to not let indigenous peoples compete with them on the open market right uh and it's you know so that they're they're there's not another competitor 
that exist. It's not like they've all of a sudden got like equal opportunity to like, like, hey, you can join the market. It's like, uh-huh. no, no, we're still seen as another entity. We're not just people. We're indigenous people. And, That's and right. therefore we have less rights or whatever. Yeah. I don't know. And so this is really well uh, documented in a book called Lost Harvest by Sarah Carter. It's quite an old book now, actually, from the, okay. it's from 19, early 1990s. Okay. Uh, and it's a really interesting book because she says, um, you know, she kind of gives her what she thought her, or her hypothesis going into the research was going to be. She's like, you know, when I went into the research, I just, I figured, um, uh, the indigenous or Indian farming policy, she calls it in her book. Um, you know, I thought wrong place, wrong time. It just, you know, it was bound for failure from the start. Um, but then when she goes and does the research, she sees all of these, uh, efforts that were made by government officials to undercut indigenous peoples to become successful farmers. Like, yeah. and you can, like, and for, uh, farming on reserves to be an economically viable uh, venture. Right. And, and so that's the one big piece of it. The other big piece, which is kind of maybe shocking for people now, is that, um, you know, pe- um, within Canada and, and, you know, the United States and, and, um, and this is, a, you know, very common in all of the, like, the British uh, settler colonies, mm-hmm. is you have, um, this very strong idea that uh, people are ranked on diff- along a ladder of civilization. Mm, uh, and right. so, you know, like um, British modernity is at the top, basically other Europeans are very close by. Uh, and then everyone else kind of moves down based on different characteristics. And so, especially for <clears throat> uh, nomadic groups, uh, you know, people who are mobile on the prairies, you are considered to be, you know, kind of at the bottom of the ladder of civilization. And so when people started to farm, um, there was a Canadian policy which prevented them from having the most current farm equipment. What? Even though you could have it because it was said, well, because you're too primitive, you have to use more primitive farm equipment. <laughs> oh my God. And so Jesus. this was actual policy in part of the Canadian government is that Indigenous peoples had to use older technology when farming for many decades sure. uh, before the, you know that th- this went away. And, you know, so not only are Indigenous peoples successful uh with farming but they're shackled by having to use older technologies and you know this is (laughs) and this is often you know farming equipment was guaranteed to people in the treaties right like this was part of the agreement you know this land agreement and then uh and then also um when you are successful you can't sell your goods on the market in in the same way other people can so yeah. You know, these are just these, a lot of extra hoops yes. and just restrictions, direct restrictions, not even hoops, just like before you even get into this, like, okay, you, you, yeah, we're not giving a fair rub. Yeah. That's right. It's yeah. Weird. Yeah. And so actually, you know, it, it's, you know, speaking of a for- forestry podcast, I, th- I think there was even a very similar thing that happened in Southern Alberta on the Pacani Reserve. Okay. Um, where, um, they had a, um, a sawmill um for you know they would harvest timber in the porcupine hills oh yeah and uh and then but i you know i don't remember the details um precisely but but i'm i'm quite certain that um that sawmill was shut down um you know by the <laughs> the department of indian affairs oh, yeah, 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 yeah just yeah. you know uh and you know these are you know so during that time these are all you know like these policies have devastating effects. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, but I, you know, I think the big thing is that, you know, this kind of this strategy that indigenous peoples are trying to implement of transitioning their economies um, to, you know, these these new economies are, you know, they're all undercut, and it it really makes it uh, in in the end. Um, very few indigenous peoples are able to be economically successful at that time. Right. Yeah. For sure. Yeah, there's just a lot of a lot of hurdles in the way and it's just yeah, there's just no support and yeah, so mm-hmm. it's so getting from there to today, how does that like how does that that difficult time like well, first, let's 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 first let's talk about the reserves a little bit. So like what was like how did the formulation of reserves affect like immediately start to affect indigenous people and then and and like how does that carry on and like how did that continue to make it difficult for them to make a living and that kind of stuff mm-hmm. like and, and they're also their interpretation of what the reserve was going to be and where they're allowed to go what they're allowed to do yeah i think um, that's a big thing right now right like you, you see a lot of reserves that are 
that are that are failing really poorly and like there's a lot of people are having a hard time and as a western society we're like well, what the hell's going on like why is this so bad yeah right? like I, I really don't know like why is this so bad right and you're like okay and you talk about residential schools and that kind of stuff and i'm sure that plays a huge role but i'm there must i'm sure there's more before we get to that point yeah you know residential schools are are huge of course because they leave a legacy of of trauma and when people are you know suffering from trauma you know life is just more difficult in general right mm-hmm. um and then it, it's it becomes difficult when you have such a you know trauma is so ever present in people's lives um cuz you know of course humans are resilient as well we're able to overcome trauma but when it when you pile it up <laughs> you know traumas after traumas it, it, you know these things are mm. are very difficult to deal with you know certainly from an economic standpoint there um reserves are, aren't always well situated and then as i talked about there's all these other factors where that prevented people from joining kind of you know emergent economies around agriculture yeah. and actually forestry at the time was right. was also uh important and like if know. you were if you were an indigenous person and you wanted to like yeah you wanted to get into agriculture did you have to do it on the reserve or could you get land off the reserve to do agriculture and still hold on to your your rights and that kind of stuff you could um you could absolutely oh actually if you don't know, it's okay. <laughs> you know what? We don't need to say what's. We don't I'm know not for sure. sure. I'm I'm thinking there would have been nothing that prevented you, but I'm actually not sure if Indigenous people could have bought property at that okay. time because yeah. there was a lot of that going on too, right? Like there wasn't. I don't think Indigenous people were even allowed to. This is jumping around a lot, but they weren't even allowed to have legal counsel until like the 70s or something, right? Yeah. Like, so the legal counsel thing was um something that was taken away in the 1920s when indigenous people started to use the courts ah yeah so they, <laughs> i didn't know that okay yeah. so what were they what what was going on there what was the um i don't know exactly what it was but i i i believe a lot of it was um indigenous people started to use the courts to sue for land rights and for uh different what would be called like aboriginal rights or treaty rights so this is often rights to hunting and fishing. Right. Um, but, their, and, but, but their legal right to counsel was just taken away. Mm-hmm. And then okay. part of that also too was I think people started to sue over the ability to undertake different cultural practices. So at that time, indigenous peoples were banned from doing different religious ceremonies. Right. Uh, and so, um, and you know, I'm sure people saw ideas like um, freedom of religion and were saying, Hey, okay, you know, okay, <laughs> yeah. okay, what do you guys mean freedom of religion? You're not letting us do potlatches or sun dances or any of these other ceremonies that we uh, do, right? And and so, um, you know, and, and then I think residential schools were also a, a huge well, part of that yeah. because one of the things that happened in the 1920s is attendance at residential schools became compulsory. Yeah. And that so that didn't happen until the 1920s. And I, I believe that was also – um, part of indigenous people's turn to the courts. And then, you know, as indigenous people started turning to the courts, then the, I guess the simple move was to make it illegal to hire a lawyer. Right. Um, and, and so, you know, that would have hurt. <laughs> in well, a, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you want to fight this? No, yeah. you're not allowed. Yeah. 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 And so, um, but you know, the, it, it's really, it's difficult to say what is put reserves in, uh, the situation we find them in today, it, it, it really is is probably an accumulation of a huge amount of factors. Um, I've already described a lot of reasons why things yeah, would not go well. Yeah. yeah. I think part of though what it is, is, is that um, for indigenous peoples, it's the ability to to not just have your society be based on like a single reserve community, but to be based on a linked set of communities, right? And yeah. so – prior to the movement on reserves, you would have had like individual bands, but also those bands would have been linked through various measures, primarily through kinship, through people understanding how they're related to different people mm. across the prairies. Okay. But the other way in which it was accomplished was through large summer gatherings and encampments, right? So you would have, you could have summer gatherings that would be <clears throat> thousands of people. Uh, and then as the winter came around uh, and it became, you know, more difficult to survive, to hunt, you would uh, disperse into smaller communities, right? But these kind of seasonal aggregations and disaggregations, mm-hmm. what it meant is that you were connected to and linked with lots of different uh, 
people. And it meant that indigenous peoples had, uh, you know, these political economic orders, which were spread across vast territories. Right. And so, and, and, you know, and not only just vast territories, but like, like, um, distinct groups of people as well. Right. You would have a, you know, connections. It wouldn't just be like Cree people who were all connected. It would be, you know, Cree people who are connected with various other nations. Right. And people were, you know, so, well, there wasn't many people who were fluent in English. People were usually multilingual in the ability to speak more than one language. So someone like Peter Erasmus, this whole book, I'm like, this guy speaks Cree, he speaks Machif, he speaks English. I'm like, but so what, you know? <laughs> yeah, who, who is this guy? Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, you just want to see a picture of him, yeah, probably. That's that's right, yeah. Like, yeah. And so, um, you know, so I think to me, that's probably one of the the less talked about legacies of reserves is that it uh, it really isolates uh, indigenous peoples and it creates, you know. And I think in some ways it actually creates an idea that your community itself should just be self-sufficient when that was uh, never really the case. Uh, okay. People were always linked. If you had a bad year, you know, let's say um, like berries in your area, the crop was bust one year, um, you could rely on your neighbors, right? To well, go – Even now, even yeah. even now, like agriculturally, if you're, if, if you're running a – you know what I mean? You're, you're farming, whatever – and you have a bad year, like you depend on insurance and on the government to help That's get right. you out of that bad year. But meanwhile, it, indigenous people were just left to their like, well, if you fail, you fail. That's on you. Uh-huh. It's kind of like, well, what? Like, uh-huh. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's interesting that you say that though. The way the way you worded that, I like that. Was that it, that the reserve system, although it was seen as being like, oh, well, like this will be like this will help us prosper in some way, um, it went the other way and it served to like isolate and kind of disconnect indigenous peoples from the rest of society uh-huh. and I'll probably probably serve to like further ingrain that social identity of being like well they're other other than mm-hmm. you know what i mean and you know i don't i don't think of it just as the linkages between reserves and the rest of canada but even different reserves abilities to link with each other right oh, for and sure so, right right right, right. And, like you were saying because they yeah, always get together yeah yeah and so you know one of the things and and this and for many decades, actually, there's even a policy where you need a pass to leave your reserve. So you can, you don't even have freedom of movement. Jesus. Uh, and there, you know, it was never actually like a full on Canadian law, but it was just like a policy that some Indian agents enforced for decades. They just do what they want. Yeah. Kind of yeah. And yeah. so, blah, 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 blah. Um, yeah. And so, it, you know, it, these, to me, um, the ability to like, you know, to have maintained larger like conglomerations of like, you know, indigenous like political and economic power. I think that to me is is probably one of the huge legacies of reserves. And then it gets compounded with, you know, legacies of trauma, often created by residential school. Yeah. Initial difficulties uh around joining kind of emergent economies, which then like, you know, just continue on in time for lots of people. Um and yeah, you know, these are all the things I think that th- – the big ones that I think of when I think of, like, the difficulties facing reserves today. Yeah, for sure. No, that totally yeah. makes sense. And for me, I feel like the – from what for just from what I gather from speaking to people is that, like, the residential schools, like, that is the big – the big thing mm-hmm. that has prevented Indigenous peoples from, from prospering the way they should. Like, had that not happened, we might be looking at a bit of a different story, right? So, yeah. Like even even for you, like personally, like how it, in your family and that kind of stuff, like I'm sure you must have you must have some kind of connection to residential schools somewhere, and like and if you're if you're if you're, if you're cool mm-hmm. talking about that, like what's what's your personal experience with with all that? Yeah, so no, my uh, my cook went to residential schools. Um, my uh, dad went to uh, day schools, which were um, schools that were still administered by the federal government or by churches. Um, although you weren't required to, to stay there. Um, and actually even I, um, spent, I went to kindergarten at a, a day school. Really? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, Isn't that bananas? Yeah. Like, oh. <laughs> so, okay. you know, and, and I went to uh, school in Wetaska in the next year. And then, um, I was one of the last years where it was still operated by the federal government because Ermanskin took control of that school in the early nineties. But yeah, when I went to kindergarten and it was eight and 88, I, 88, 89, something like that. Yeah. Um, um, yeah, it was still operated by the federal government. And so, 
you know, these are things that I, you know, they have an effect on everyone, right? Uh, and it's not just an effect on children. You know, one of the things that, um, you know, so I had a chance, I've had a chance to listen to the co-commissioners of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission multiple times. And in fact, Wilton Littlechild was my next door neighbor growing up. Oh, really? Yeah. But um, this one comes actually from uh, Marie Wilson. She was really good at explaining that residential schools didn't just have an effect on children. They had an effect on parents, right? Because you would have your you would be living your life without kids. Uh, and, you know, so you have communities where kids are just disappearing for most of the year. Uh, and that has an effect on the way in which adults behave. And, and you know, I think, you know, she says oh. that a, a lot of um, uh, legacies of addictions uh, actually come out of the fact that there was no kids around uh, and people, you know, had, like you know one it's the difficulty of like losing your kids for a long yeah times of forcibly the year. so forcibly yeah. so like yeah. early on it was they were literally like it was like you said it was mandatory they were mm-hmm. taken like yeah. people use the word kidnapped that's right from their homes and yeah. forced into these like these religious schools where they're trying to mm-hmm. indoctrinate them into canadian society and beat into them the you know your culture is bad it's yeah the devil uh-huh. yeah yeah but you can you know one could see like you know you, like how drinking might become a problem, you know, in well, yeah. scenarios like that. Right. And so, mm-hmm. um, you know, residential schools affected different families in, uh, different ways. Um, and so, you know, one of the things you hear about is that, um, you know, some people say they, they like residential schools or residential schools gave them an opportunity for education. And I think, you know, this is, um, in some cases, this is actually, true like at residential schools did provide an opportunity to become further educated so like uh my grandmother like my cookum she um got a teaching certificate at u of a but she spent most of her uh i think up until grade nine or ten in residential schools right but she was she had she did have success in in residential schools i you know i think the thing is not that um we should deny that some people um didn't gain education in residential schools, but that one on the whole, um, residential schools were awful for people and the level of education was typically substandard. But of course, you're going to have some exceptional students who are going to, you know, do well in residential schools and make something of it, right? Like that's just like part of human exceptionalism, right? Some people are always going to make the best of their their situation. But, I, you know, I think the the bigger point is not um, that – um, there were some good things and and some bad things, but that indigenous peoples need to be allowed to be in charge of how their stories are told. Imagine today yeah. if we were just like, okay, every single child has to go to this Muslim school here in Alberta, <laughs> right? Like you have to go to this Muslim school. You have to learn about being a Muslim and learn that Christianity and Catholicism and all that other stuff is horrible. Yeah. It's hell, uh-huh. and your 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 parents are basically Satan. Like imagine how that would impact. Like, no, there would be, there would yeah, be riots and war. Yeah. Like, it would not be okay. So it's like, yeah, I can't imagine the impact that mm-hmm. it has, right? And, mm-hmm. you know, it's – individuals should be allowed to represent their own stories, right? So if, of course, of if, course. Uh, you know, if someone had a good exper- – if an Indigenous person had a good experience in residential schools, I would never – try to take that away from them or deny it. Yeah. I think the bigger question or like the the bigger point that I'm trying to make is that for non-Indigenous peoples, when you try to understand residential schools, you can't take the story of a single individual and yeah. then blow it up to represent the experience of everyone. Ah, uh, good point. Right? Like that. And okay. so it, that's why, you know, when I say like Indigenous peoples need to have the ability to represent our own stories, uh, it, what it means is that you have to listen to multiple people. And you have to get a bigger context and sense of, um, of you know what a, an experience with a particular institution in this case residential schools, what it meant for Indigenous peoples. Yeah. You can't just go cherry pick, um, um, you know, your one Native friend who had a good experience, and then <laughs> say, well, uh, you know, I think all these other people are wrong because my buddy said that you yeah. know his experience was good, right? Yeah. And yeah. so the I think to me this is what comes down to you know the willingness to have a, a relationship with indigenous peoples is that you can't just like pick one indigenous 
person and then say they get to represent everyone uh, yeah. it's that you have to like deal with the you know with a group right of course so, it's yeah. a, there are people and there's there's yeah. there's a difference of opinion in all people you can't just be like oh they all have the same perspective they're all the yeah. same person they're all yeah i get you i get you yeah so and you know and and on that front it it's like overwhelming that uh indigenous schools were something that were, were very very difficult for you know <laughs> for indigenous uh communities yeah a lot of people that I spoke with who's – yeah, like mostly grandparents or mm-hmm. parents had um, direct – yeah, they, ta- they talk about how they never – their parents never ever talked about basically that like 15-year period of their life. Mm-hmm. Like never mm-hmm. heard them talk about it ever, right? And the assumption was that it was it was so traumatic that it was not something that you want to – it's like it's like talking to a war veteran and be like, oh, how was World War II? It's like there's a reason they're not talking about it. That's right. It's yeah. like this has been – so it's – yeah, it's a weird one to me that it's that's not something that that's more common knowledge in this. You know what I mean? Like it, that it only stopped thirty years ago, and and it's not something that we've like you went you. <laughs> I mean, I'm sure when you went, it probably like it was much different. But it was much yeah, different. I'm but, sure, but yeah, no, but it it does put it in perspective that yeah. you know I attended like a, a a day school that was run by the federal government. Yeah, yeah, that's kind of what it was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's it's it changed over time, but like yeah, the, the situation created there. Yeah, it was never. It, yeah, it was never intended to help Indigenous people do well. Yeah, let's put it that way. I guess absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So when we talk about um, like the current situation regarding Indigenous peoples today in Canada, especially, um, what is some of the major like the major misconceptions that's like like like, like that's like holding people back that like say. Um, I'm trying. I'm trying to figure out like how do we help Indigenous people today, right? Like there's been all of this trauma, this history of injustice and miscommunication, and and just and just a lot of times just plain racism in a lot of it, right? Mm-hmm. Um, how do we get away from that history and start to help? You know what I mean? Start to include the full history of Canada into our understanding so that we can we can, like you said before at the very beginning of this, treaties are supposed to be a good thing. Yeah. Right? This is a this is a a a, a meeting of, of two peoples that we can work together and 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 live together and, and prosper together on the land. And right now, by the signing of the treaties, settler groups like my ancestors and everything else have done really, really, really well. Mm-hmm. Like, continue to prosper, continue to get richer, to continue to just do well. And indigenous people have continued to decline in their in their prosperity and their and their health and everything, yeah. right? So, like, clearly, there's one side of the treaty here that is not being upheld, right? Yeah. So, so how how do we start to make it so that this is something that's good for everybody and not just like, well, we'll continue to prosper on the backs of of you know what I mean? This situation, absolutely. I, you know, um, like obviously, I think that there is immediate steps that we can. Uh, take, you know, as a as a country to deal with uh, these issues. Mm. Um, but, uh, you know, on a bigger picture sense, I, I think, you know, it comes back to this idea of like, do treaties lie at the foundation of this country or is it the doctrine of discovery? Uh, right. right? Yes, okay. and, and to nice, me... Nice wraparound, really. Yeah. <laughs> like, that, um, to me, that's a question of, do we want this country to be founded on colonization or... And, what people often call today like settler colonization, right? Because it's colonization was something that typically ended, whereas settler colonization is you came to settle and stay. And, you know, rather than join, um, rather than join existing societies, you brought your own laws with you, right? Like right. that is, that's what the process of settlement is, right? And this yeah. is like, I use the, that term, it, that's, that term is very controversial these days. Many people, uh, many non-Indigenous peoples take offense to it. But I, I use it because it was a, um, that was a, it's a historically accurate term. That was a term yeah. that British people used. It's to not des- meant to be offensive. It's just to the describe fact. themselves. Yeah. yeah. And so, yeah. you know, I don't always use that term, but it's a, a, it's a historically factual term. And so, um, you know, if we don't want to be, a society built on settler colonization, but we want to be a society built on a treaty relationship. Well, then we have, then we have to move ourselves that way. Right. And how we do that is going to be really difficult. And so, you know, I, I think one of the things I think about sometimes is we are a really wealthy society. And in fact, there's even, you know, many non or many indigenous peoples get to get to um, participate and benefit in the wealth of, our society as well. Although, 
many non-indigenous peoples don't and even for indigenous peoples who are um who have done well for themselves economic or like financially the the fact of being indigenous is that you're always related to and connected to people who struggle right like that yeah. is just like a, no indigenous person gets to escape that yeah um but at the same point you know even though we're a wealthy society there scarcity is always a thing right and and you know we're always challenged by questions of who gets what and how do we distribute resources and uh like you know how do we how do we generate them but how do we distribute them right and there's in those questions there's always winners and losers um and so you know it it i think to some level there does have to be some reckoning on the part of non-indigenous people in this country of okay how do we make decisions um where indigenous peoples are going to benefit more right, right? And, and like there's no magic wand that can be waved and like you know i right now i um you know, I, I could give you a 10 point bulletin of what I think needs to happen, but, <laughs> yeah. but I don't think those things are necessarily helpful. I, you know, I, I think, um, the bigger issue is that, uh, non indigenous peoples need to really take on this idea of being a treaty partner with indigenous peoples. Sure. And if you take this idea seriously, then I think that there's lots of things that, that flow from it in terms of, of how, um, how our society will change and look yeah. different. Yeah. Right? Do we, yeah. do we want to move forward having this history of this history of hate and discrimination against indigenous people um, and be like, yeah, we're okay with that. Mm -hmm. Or do we want to move forward and just be like, Hey, why don't we support this culture and try to, you know what I mean? Become better for it. Right. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah. like ultimately the more diverse of opinions you have, the stronger the country, right? Like you're just going to have, more opportunity for different ideas and different perspectives. And like, so do we want to be proud of, of indigenous people and allow them to be like a huge part of the future of this country mm -hmm. and of the way we, you know what I mean? Or do we want to just continue to look back and be like, well, I mean, it's kind of their problem. Yeah. Right. So it's <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, and I, I, uh -huh. and yeah. So it's a weird one too. Cause like, like, like we said at the very beginning, I could go my entire life without doing anything for indigenous people. And it would, I would never know it. Uh -huh. Whereas indigenous people, like the opposite isn't true, right? Like mm -hmm. they, they, they depend, they're dependent on the mass majority of people are non-indigenous in the, in the country and mm -hmm. like without support. Yeah. How are they? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It just, it's, it's, it's weird for me to hear people say stuff like, oh, they're given, you know what I mean? They're given everything, like all the opportunity, all these handouts and they just squander it or whatever. Mm -hmm. Right. And you're like, okay, but what exactly are they given first of all? How are they squandering it? And what is going on? Like, what is the context of this? Right? Like it's not, so it's, it's sad when you hear a lot of that, right? You hear a lot of those, that stereotype and that discrimination. Yeah. But it's, um, I mean, we're, I feel like we're moving away from it, but it still exists today in 2020. We're still dealing with this. Yeah. You know, I would never claim that, you know, economic mismanagement doesn't happen, um, within indigenous nations, but economic mismanagement happens everywhere, right? Yeah. But you know, when you're when you deal with poverty, um, there's very difficult circumstances that are often placed on people, which cause them to, you know, to act in ways um, where you try to preserve resources for yourself. But it, you know, to me, the bigger question is not one of economic mismanagement. Some of that will happen sometimes, but for indigenous peoples, you know, there's a huge incentive to not. Uh, economically mismanaged funds because we're trying to we're trying to create a bright future for ourselves as well right like we don't want to um we don't want to be stuck in a situation where we're continually dependent or um or that you know we're not successful in you know various areas of like you know government and business yeah. and you know all of the, these areas um but at a certain level you know, those things are all besides the point. Like at a certain level, it's if you're really believe in a treaty relationship, then you believe that indigenous peoples have political rights and that they have to be dealt with as such. Right. Right. They're, they're, and, they're, they're citizens, the same as everybody else. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, and, and that those political rights are, are distinct and that they, um, and that they, there's certain, um, what, what flows from it is, is, uh, a political relationship that has to take place between indigenous and non-indigenous people in the country. Yeah. And, and that we're still a long ways from working that out. And even though I think some days I am quite optimistic that we are on, we've set ourselves up on a path, uh, 
which could be productive uh, moving into the future. Um, at the end of the day, if we're if we're on that path right now, we're just starting it really in lots of ways. Yeah. And you know, it doesn't mean that we haven't had relationships for generations, um, you know, throughout the history of of Canada, but that um, more often than not, the political rights that Indigenous peoples have as like as collectives yeah. have been uh, dismissed uh, by the rest of Canada. It's as simple as that. Yeah. Eh? Like just dismissed. It's not that yeah. they're actively like, like today, it's not like people are actively like, like, oh, you know, fuck indigenous people. It's just like, mm-hmm. they're just, they're just dismissing it. Mm-hmm. And just like, well, I have this other problem. I have to worry about myself and my family and whatever. And we all yeah. do that. It's not, that's not, but just, yeah, dismiss yeah. is a good word for it. Cause yeah. it's just kind of pushed aside. Yeah. Right? yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, you know, we all face conditions of, of scarcity. Like it is scarcity is something that we deal with as societies, but at the same point, we're we're also very privileged in lots of ways as well uh, to live in Canada, and you know what. So what I would hope is that um, there's a real willingness to you know to to share in all of those things. But for me, yeah, obviously there's concrete steps that um, we can take, but people have to go figure that out in their own situations based on uh, the context that they're in. Yeah. And if and if you're in a position where you're like, I have no clue what I would concrete steps I would take to do. That's probably because you haven't thought about it enough. Sure. And, then, yeah, yeah, yeah. and yeah. so, um, you know, so one, you know, it's, it's just that in general, we have to start putting more effort into thinking how indigenous peoples are going to prosper mm-hmm. uh, in this country. But, at, you know, at a basic level that there has to be a, a real willingness or recognition that there is a, a political relationship based on treaty and that we have to become treaty partners if we're going to yeah. be able to tell the story in this country that we're proud of, I think. And to this point, we haven't really been treaty partners in your opinion. Like it's just not the, 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 the Western end of the treaty hasn't been upheld. No, I, yeah. it, it, no, it, it hasn't been. Um, it has been in some ways like, yeah, there are indigenous peoples um, are able to benefit from treaty rights uh, in all sorts of different ways Mm -hmm. but you know what the really it has to be bigger than just indigenous peoples getting some rights it has to be about like what it means for um you know two different societies to get along with each other yeah right right Mm -hmm. i love that that's a good way to put it because these are like you're like you said these are two different societies trying to coexist in an area together while both Mm -hmm. prosper and to this point only one part of one society has been prospering and the other one not so much so yes there's there's a there's a there's an imbalance there for sure yeah yeah for sure yeah but yeah. there was there was a couple other things like the the word and i don't know if this is something that you feel comfortable speaking to or not but um when you listen to people indigenous people talk about today a lot of people will use the words um like reconciliation and like decolonization yeah right can you explain what they mean by that, like what that, because because decolonization almost sounds like, hey, get your shit and get out of here. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Whereas, like, but what is what is what do these words actually mean? And it, especially in context of like today, yeah, right. Like when when someone's asking for reconciliation and decolonization, what does that mean? Yeah, the way in which I take the term decolonization, because we live in a country where people are not gonna like leave Canada and go back to Europe (laughs) and to Asia and Africa and like all the, you know, people have come from all over the world, right. To to live in, in Canada. And so, you know, in this context, decolonization is going to look different than it looked like in other parts of the world where the decolonization movement meant um, that European powers gave up control over foreign territories and often left. Right. Right. Um, In the Canadian situation, what decolonization means is that you have to shift from becoming um, somebody who is a colonizer to somebody who is a treaty partner? Ah, and what just that, that mind shift, just that brain, yeah, swap. Okay, and and it's you know it has to be more than just the brain swap, because it, it has to probably at some level involve a change in material, uh, the material reality of our our country, so that you know indigenous peoples uh, are able to you know benefit in the same way as as other peoples in Canada. Yeah. yeah. But you know, if if the if being a colonizer is that you know the foundation of the country is you know settler colonization, then that's uh, 
how I think of decolonization is you move from being, you know, being founded on settlement and colonization to being founded on a treaty relationship. I like that. Yeah. But that's that's a such so much better of a story. Yeah. To be like, hey, we came here. There was like or whatever. Let's say the the, the English came here, right? Yeah. And like the, and it was there was some there was a bunch of shit that happened. It was bad. Yeah. It was good. And it was whatever. <laughs> and then we signed these treaties. And this is supposed to be this like come together as like a friendship agreement uh-huh. kind of thing. And let's be proud of this of this document and learn to give learn to live together and yeah. kind of support it in the true sense of what it's supposed to be yeah um that's so much better of a it's just a it's just a better idea of canada yeah than like hey we came here took this this is ours and like yeah those those people over there they can do what they need to do and yeah it's fine do your thing whatever no it, <laughs> so <laughs> but you know the if we want that to be the story that we tell then we have to be able to live it yeah totally also too yeah yeah and then, then it comes to the question, like, how do we live it, right? Like, how do we – I know you said you have your own opinions on how we – 10 point thing on how we do that. But, <laughs> yeah, like, how how do we? Like, what is the best way that a person today, a, a non-Indigenous person today, or even an Indigenous person, that they can, they can support that idea, that reality that we want to try to accomplish? You know, it's interesting. I was talking with um, one of my friends about, um, you know, saying that you're for decolonization. Uh, and you know, when I explain it, like, you know, it's moving from like, a f- from a position of being like a, a settler or a colonizer to being a treaty partner. I think a lot of non-indigenous peoples are ready and willing to make that jump, but it's not like voting. It's not, you can't go, you know, mark a, a checkbox off. And I, I yeah. think sometimes that's the, the impulse is like, you know, sign me up. Like, where do you, like, I'm, I'm on, yes, I'm, I'm on for board. this. I am for this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Where's the form? Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. And, you know, but unfortunately, that's not the situation. Decolonization, I talk about it more as being a craft or a practice. Okay. And you have to be able to build out your skill set, uh, in terms of, of being somebody who, uh, practices decolonization as well as just being committed to it. Right. Yeah. And building out that skill set is actually quite hard because we don't have a lot of tools which have helped people build it out. Um, and I, you know, this is, this is more so true of non-Indigenous peoples, but it's also true of Indigenous peoples to some extent where we are so constantly under duress and like, a, you know, under a difficult situation. It, it actually can be quite hard to imagine what, yeah. you know, what a, a decolonized future looks like. And in, yeah. in, in fact, for me, sometimes it's actually impossible to imagine yeah. um, what it looks like as well. Uh, but that is, that's because it's, it's hard to practice in, in yeah. the present, right? Because you're, it's, you're almost sometimes so um, used to having to, you know, fight for every single little thing. Yeah. Um, but I, you know, I think the bigger goal is that it's, it's a, you know, it's a craft and you have to work on it. You have to build it out. And, and then, you know, like all crafts, like as you put your time and your energy into it, you become more comfortable with it and you become more skilled and adept at, at doing it over time. I think also like a craft, it means that you have to keep working at it. It's yeah. not something that you ever, um, you can ever just like, you know, let fade away. Like, yeah, yeah. um, you know, it, it like, you know, it's not like riding a bike. Like once you know how to do it, you're just, you're good. You don't have to think about it anymore. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, yeah you know, yeah. It, it's, a, it's, it's a practice that you have to keep up at and that you have to, yeah. um, keep moving to, to be able to implement it. It's, it's something that you have to constantly kind of be aware of. And Continue to work your at. competence. Yes. Kind of like a professional yeah. thing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, and it, you know, so y- very interestingly, like the competence and professional thing, that's how um, Naomi Metallic, who's uh, the director of the Indigenous Law Program at Dalhousie out in Halifax, that's how she describes Indigenous law. She's like, you're not learning about Indigenous law as part of, you know, a social – for a social justice purpose or to, you know, to out of like the goodness of your heart. You're learning about Indigenous law because you can't be a competent lawyer unless you have a basic understanding of what Indigenous law means. Right. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, I, th- I think there's even for professional associations, there actually is, that has to actually just be part of it too. But that, to me, that's part of the bigger craft of decolonization in this country is there at some level, there does have to be increased training yeah. um, of how we understand these issues in relation to, to different people's professions. Oh, for sure. Well, yeah. yeah, dude, I even like, I feel like I've 
been paying a lot of attention like the last few years of my life where i've started to start to pay more attention to indigenous s- stuff that's going on right yeah. and the, the word decolonization when i first hear it i'm like that rubs me the wrong way i'm like what the hell does that mean mm-hmm. right like yeah kind of like i get the i get the picture of like yeah. pick, up, pick up your shit and go back to england or that's whatever right. right and and that's not you're, what it means you're getting on one of those old-timey boats with sails and you're like <laughs> this is bullshit <laughs> <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, why can't i take a plane <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. yeah so it's like that's i think that's the idea that a lot of people get yeah. right they're like they're like oh they're telling us to leave canada it's like no 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 we're just saying like hey can we have a can we change the way we can we do what we agreed to do? Mm-hmm. Is basically yeah. all we're saying. Can we agree what we agreed to do because we haven't been doing that so far. We've been taken advantage of and not like yeah, yeah. It's so yeah. It, it's 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 funny. Like I just see the word like decolonization like like blowing up on Twitter as like just this crazy. You know what I mean? Like just say, just being like a, this this troll thing or whatever. Yeah. Right? Like I could just see it being just a just uh-huh. a the dog fight on Twitter. Well, kind of thing. and you know, and reconciliation is the other big word as well. And in fact, yeah. reconciliation has much more. Uh, usage in terms of like a, a conventional and a mainstream sense it's um you know something we, we hear about often in the present a lot of that i think was because of the truth and reconciliation commission right and it had you know the release of that final re- report had this gravitational pull on canadian consciousness that i i'm not sure anything else uh has has had that pull uh, like the TRC final report. And, you know, I think part of that was people coming to terms and confronting the, you know, the the horrors of residential schools in a lot of ways. And it, it was just very shocking for people. And I, I think it allowed people to maybe understand in a, in a different way, connect um, the situation that Indigenous peoples that we find ourselves in today with the fact that there's, you know, historical reasons for that have led to this situation. Right. Yeah. And, and so, um, you know, reconciliation, um, I think reconciliation has been useful in the fact that it's opened up a space to talk about it stuff, but just when we open up space to talk about something, you know, we could just fill it back in with all our old habits. Right. So it, reconciliation in and of itself doesn't do anything. It's only a matter of whether or not we use that that space that's been op- opened up and, you know, what is, you know, people have given it a little bit of their bandwidth now, right? Like yeah. pe- like indigenous issues now are, are something that people are willing to to take the time to learn about and to talk about more. Um, but, you know, it can't just be all talk, right? Yeah. And, and so... Um, yeah, how do we put this to paper, right? Yeah. How do we make this something real? Yeah, and so you know, we're still waiting to find out what the impact of of reconciliation will be as a historical moment, I would say. And to what extent that, you know, that space that's opened up will stick around and will then be able to make an impact moving forward. And so, you know, there there's lots of uh I think fantastic indigenous intellectuals who have provided these critiques of reconciliation that we might be aware of, right? So like, you know, what, like, what is the word reconcile? Like, you know, one of it is like a bank ledger, right? Like it's, you know, to reconcile accounts, right? And, and so if that's the way in which people approach it, that that's probably not a good idea because I think the, the danger is that we'll just say, okay, we have all this historical injustice. Let's go solve it and then leave the past behind us and then we'll continue on as Canada, right? But right. I think what, one of the things that Indigenous peoples are saying is, you know, to continue on as Canada means that we have to have a treaty relationship. right? And that means an ongoing relationship. So it's not something we can leave in the past. It's actually, in in a way, we have to um, look to the past even more uh, yeah. and to really like... To be true with ourselves, right? Yeah. Like that's, that's, yeah. Like, that's the one thing that a lot of people get upset about and talk about, well, we can't forget the past. Like we can't take down these statues. We can't ignore the past. And it's like, yeah. well, we're not forgetting the past. We're, we're bringing to light the true past of what yeah. actually happened. And let's, let's appreciate everything for what it actually is and not what, you know, the government at the time decided we should know about kind of yes. thing, right? Yeah. No, when the... You know, when the John A. M. McDonald statue comes around, I'm like, don't, I don't, won't forget about that guy. I promise. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he yeah. did some pretty bad things. I, rem- I will remember. Yeah, don't we're going to remember. It's not yeah. going anywhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, so, you know, so that's one of the, the things with, um, reconciliation. And, and then, of course, even, you know, this idea of reconciling a past is to relegate something to the past as well and to yeah. not, to not 
believe that we're still dealing with injustices in our present. Yeah. Uh, and so, you know, there, there's, um, you know, there's reasons to be suspicious of the term reconciliation, but I, I do think in a, a real sense that it, it has created space to talk about these issues. Um, but that, you know, we're, we're nowhere close to knowing how it's going to turn out. For sure. Yeah. I like, I like the way you put it. I don't know if you said this or if I thought this in my mind after you s- supported it <laughs> was, uh, it's like, it's in a way we have to redefine Canada, right? Redefine what we mean by Canada and like start to identify with indigenous culture a little more and just start to just be supportive of it instead of just dismissive. Mm-hmm. Like you, like you had said earlier, right? Like let's, Let's, let's allow indigenous peoples and indigenous culture to be something we can be proud of and, and, a, and a part of this culture that we can continue or you can start to support and you yeah. know what I mean and like be something to be happy about and work together and like it's just it's just a better story right but it's yeah but we're afraid of letting go of the past I guess I don't know what the hell but it's a it's a it's a it's a crazy conversation to even try and have right yeah like, like we, we just talked for almost two hours and I still feel like I'm, I know, I know a lot more than I did before going into this conversation, but I still have like, it's still like, where do we go from here? Like, how do we do this? Right. It's just such a hard question to solve. (laughs) Like, yeah, yeah. It's just, it it seems never ending. Right. But it it all hopes the, hopefully we'll continue to move down that path and have conversations like this, I guess is all you can really do. Right. Just continue to have conversations and try to. I don't know, try to make it the norm. I guess yeah. any social movement, right? That's all it is, really. You just you just keep doing it until it, you can't ignore it anymore. Yeah, well, you know, change is, is interesting because it's hard to see it when it's happening, right? It's only uh, easier to spot in retrospect. And, and so, you know, it, I think it's real easy to believe and to feel that we're this kind of monolith that is incapable of changing. But of course, we know that, you know, that's not true. Like history is... is, is full of changes right? yeah. and, and and so you know at, at some point we have to believe in ourselves to be able to make those changes but mm. but part of that means that you know all of these um all of these old habits we have to think about and to approach this issue um has to be you know we we have to reevaluate them mm. and and decide what can stay and what has to go. And and probably a lot of things are going to have to go. Yeah. And, and it's, you know, being able to replace that with an understanding of what a, a treaty relationship is going to look like. Yeah, for sure. It makes sense. Just not continuing to do things because it's how we've done things. Mm-hmm. It's like, let's don't need to be afraid of change. Like you said, right? Like yeah. just let's change is good. It's happening all the time. Let's just support it and, and know that, that's a good thing, right? Like, for sure. So, yeah, this is awesome, man. Well, this is a good conversation. Sweet. I didn't know where we were going to go, but it went, a good, <laughs> it went a fun place. Anyways, nice. for me, I learned a lot. So <laughs> thanks a lot for doing this. Cool. I hope you liked that. Like I said, my favorite episode, Matt knows how to do it. He's an excellent podcaster. <laughs> I don't know if he knows it, but he is. Crushed it. And, uh, yeah, I just always learn from this episode. Um, it went so well, and I think he's so – honest and open and it all all those good things that you want to be a good communicator and get a message across and i just loved it so uh if you have any questions for me or for matt just uh, shoot me an email your forest podcast at gmail.com and i will get back to you and please rate and review leave a comment and share it on social media all that stuff it's really really helpful and uh, i really appreciate it so uh with all that having been said We'll see you guys in a few weeks with another episode. Take it easy.